It's a UFO. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on Ask How About Again. I'm your host, Brad Jerry, and surprise, we're still under lockdown. Our mood has been bad. Well, today I'm going to start off with a little of something known as aliens. Oh. Now that's right. I don't know how many of you have seen this video on the, on internet or on YouTube or even on Instagram, but we have a, an exclusive clip, a close-up look of the UFO which has been circulating around. Oh, I'm uh, I'm so sorry. I we don't have that exclusive video, but here's the thing which is circulating around the internet, and apparently this was released by the Pentagon. Uh, they, uh, the whole fleet of them look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, that thing, dude. That's not an LNS, though, is it? It's not. That is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's like a thing, it's rotating. Funny thing about that video, it's a UFO. Regardless, they're so cool and calm about it. Like, it's just another UFO. You know, it doesn't really matter. And the crazy part is, the world doesn't really give, seem to give a shit. I mean, I guess I have a reason for that. Because we have our own problem right now. We have the Corona team. That's right. The global pandemic hasn't necessarily gone any better. It's just getting worse and worse. But we are trying to cope up with it. The UFO video and the virus right now, made me realize that these two are in coincidences. It can be a conspiracy. It made me question the origins of the virus itself. And more than that, it made me question the origins of us. And more than that, it made me question the mighty evolutionary theory. So to sort out all these problems, we called on an expert, Dr. Subhash Raj Puroi. He's an expert in evolutionary biology. He's broadly trained in ecology and evolutionary physiology. Currently, this How Organisms Work Lab is more commonly known as How Lab and he works on how organisms respond to climate change using Indian drosophila as a model organism. Now, those are his, you know, work titles says, you know, everyday mundane work things. But here's a title you might not have heard of. According to legend, this man is not just a part of Homo sapiens, he's also part of drosophila. Because he has a lot of help. Find out more on that and the interview on evolution. Take a look on. Take a look at this interview. Dr. Subhash Rajparavit, thank you for joining us today, and I hope you and your family are safe. Yeah, we are safe, and thank you for having <laughs> me here. Okay. And uh, we are so glad we could do this. And so, first off, so before we get into evolution as a topic, let's start with your own evolution, sir. What drove you, or rather, what evolutionary drive made you become? Or rather, maybe choose evolutionary balance as a field. Yeah, so Pranay, you know, I was raised in the middle of a Thar desert. <laughs> so okay. I was always fascinated by organisms and the mountains, which are both rare in a desert. Okay. So that was my first fascination. So I always loved mountains and the animals. And okay. then biology wasn't the best option because you can see the animals very close, close by, and then I also had a habit to travel. And because I like mountains, the biology worked out very fantastic for me. And this all started because I never decided when I was in college that I never thought that I will, I will turn out to be an evolutionary biologist or a scientist. This all started from a fellowship. So while doing my bachelor's, I applied for Indian Academy of Sciences summer fellowship and I got selected. and ended up one month with a Bhatnagar fellow at Banaras Hindu University in his cytogenetics lab where he was using fruit flies. So since okay. then, my romance with the fruit flies is always fresh and creative. So right. uh, that's how I was introduced to the flies. And then uh, during my early PhD days, I just spent half of the time traveling in Western Himalayas covering the altitudinal transits, collecting populations from different elevations, bring them back to the laboratory, do some assays and try to find out how these flies are adapting to changing elevation, how they're adapted. So those were the questions. And later on, like 
I got a little deeper into the questions and queries and then started looking at the mm -hmm. genes and alleles and the, most recently like at the genomics level. And right now we are trying to understand how organisms are responding to the climate change in which we are trying to map at the genomics level. What are your genomic reasons which are most sensitive in talking to the climate? So That's how it all okay. started. All right. Well, that, that's a lovely answer, actually. So what I can take away from that is like nature is what drove you towards this, you know? Yeah, in some sense, you can tell that. Yeah. So you must, love, those... field trips, so you must love field trips then? Yeah, I love. I enjoy them. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that's great. That's great. And I uh, tell others, like every time when I go to the class, you might have heard that. I tell you guys that whatever you can do in your young life, go travel, see the world. That's the best time. Yeah. All right, all right. So, I mean, I, personally speaking, I like to stay in one place, you know. <laughs> so, that's okay. <laughs> but uh, that's genetics, well, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is. Totally agree. I blame my parents, not myself. It's my parents' problem that I am this way. Uh, anyway, so talking about evolution and your evolution now, let's go to evolution as a subject. Now, evolution is widely regarded as the fact of how life became or came about to be but mm -hmm. why can't it be a hoax what if and the record for fossil record like you know they can say the fossil record is the most apt indication of the uh, evolution somebody could just dug and put it in there why is it uh, the only record which is possible so uh, yeah you are asking this very very wrong question to an evolutionary biologist okay <laughs> let me let me answer this question okay so uh, like I don't think so that it's hoax because uh, you have to get into the history and back into the literature and you will come across with few faces and one of the, you know, well decorated faces Darwin. And when you see what he, he observed in those five years on the, you know, on the trip on the Beagle and collecting the facts where similarities and dissimilarities were found, that, that fact itself, you know, reject the word hoax. And then if you, if you ask me to give a very specific and very, you know, uh, like a pinpoint answer, like where I could entirely reject your word that hoax, which people routinely use. Uh, we see honeybees everywhere, right? Right. It's all across the world, right? Yep. And interestingly, these honeybees have an enemy. Okay. And the name of that enemy is hornet. Okay, it's a right, it's right. a larger sentence. Right. So what hornet does actually? Hornet, whenever it sees a honeybee, it attacks on a honeybee hive, and what it does, it decap starts decapitating honeybees, and this this process is so fast that within few hours, that entire nest is the mass deaths under that nest. It decapitates each and every honeybee. So now the interesting thing is here. So the Asian honeybees know how to handle a hornet, but European and American honeybees don't know that. Well, that just may be because they're white. No, no, <laughs> no. It's not like that. Okay. So because Asian honey, because these hornets are found in Asian countries only, the okay. Asian reason only. Okay. So these honeybees have a known enemy, and in the like the history of life or during the evolutionary path, these honeybees somehow come up with a way by which they can handle this hornet attack. And they do it very interestingly because this hornet was absent in the other part of the world, like in Europe and America. So those right. honeybees never you know, came across such a situation. So I'm trying to get into and connect with an environment, the kind of environment you live and you or me or in any other organism. And they have to come up with some method to survive against that condition. So like European and American honeybees never encountered that an enemy kind of hornet, whereas Asian honeybees, they occasionally frequently coming across. So they right. develop a mechanism. What is that mechanism? Whenever a hornet enters in a hive, these honeybees come together like in numbers of 50 to 100 and they encircle and engulf that hornet and makes a ball. Okay. And start vibrating their wings vigorously. And that creates like temperature inside that wall is close to 50 degrees centigrade. Which temperature? Which is close to 
where honeybees can handle that temperature, whereas hornet cannot handle beyond 46 degrees. So within a few oh. minutes, less than one or two minutes, that hornet is just roasted inside. That's how they handle it. Now I ask you a very simple question. This entire mechanism evolved like in past like maybe 1,000, 2,000 or like millions of years, whatever. It was entirely absent in the other part of the world. So this is um, an example which comes from the behavior, which is really very complicated. You are talking about a bone, someone, you know, mischievously placed it somewhere. That's one example or two such cases. But it's entirely not like that, you know, because these fossil samples are rigorously tested for their carbon dating and all that. It's a very complicated process. So wherever some serious science is there, like, you know, bad science and like those um, uh, drawing parallel lines and all that, that bad side of science we, we, we often come across. So I don't get into that bad side, but, but I, I can give you hundreds such examples where I can, you know, ultimately convince you that evolution is true. Well, no, no. Once I heard that roasting comment, I was convinced. You know, okay. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm converted. I believe in evolution right now. And I hope this does convert the folks, people or just non-believers into, you know, people who believe in evolution. But happy to hear that. Cool. All right. So moving on to, okay, let, now that it's been established, let's move on to how it can be studied and, you know, how it can, you know, make it more, how can we make it, build a theory on evolution and how can it be studied? So it's very simple, you know, like evolution, like today it's, it's like a well-established discipline and like, uh, like particularly in my case, like fruit flies, like there are around 3000 plus scientists working on different aspects using fruit flies and many of them are evolution biologists. And uh, like evolution, how it functions and all that, uh, I can put it in four basic, you know, mechanisms by which you can, by which it can function and can occur. It's natural selection, mutations, random drift and migration. If you get into in details, like natural selection is as simple as I explained to you. That's the example which I gave you. That could be because of the natural selection. You have an enemy, you have to come across with something. And okay. that's how things are that. I give you the best example, like, uh, particularly like for the Indian students, like you collect fruit fly populations at different latitudes all the way from the south to the north, you will see there is a positive climb for drought tolerance. So all the North Indian flies are more tolerant to the drought than the southern flies. And it's opposite for the starvation. So most of the southern flies are more starvation tolerant than the northern flies. And this increase or decrease is very systematic along the latitude. So lots of climatic variables come into the function and all that. So this could be a good example of natural selection, how populations have adapted to the immediate environmental conditions. Then genetic drift, it could be, you know, it could randomly happen. Migration, one individual can go somewhere else and can, you know, uh, donate some genes and those genes can get into the germline of that existing populations and that can drive that, you know, early frequency changes and that way it could happen. It can suddenly appear like at a point mutation kind of mutation kind of changes. So these are some basic processes by which, you know, natural, that evolution could occur. Yeah. Well, um, that in terms of evolution as, you know, species and organisms, maybe how they've learned to live together, or how they, you know, fight against each other. But I don't know if you've heard this, sir. There's this little known thing known as a virus, which has caused this huge global pandemic. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, and, and, I, and I just want to, I have one simple question about in terms of evolution, where does it fall? I mean, it seems to be completely different from our, from the whole ecosystem of organisms. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there are different things, you know, like, um, so I want to take you to the student textbooks where how evolution badly is explained and written in some of the textbooks, you know, that evolution ladder, right? Yeah. 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 And many of you also, like at the master's level, uh, not out of that wrong notion. So but that typical image where there is a ladder and the, uh, a homo sapien is sitting That's at it. the top yeah. and rest yeah. everything below that homo sapien. Yeah. So it's an entirely wrong notion, by the way. Okay. Oh. If, you ask, if you ask me as an evolutionary biologist, where, where do all the terrestrial organisms sit and where do they belong? I will say all the terrestrial organisms are basically a fish. Because we all evolved from the animals which were living in the water. Okay. Yeah. 
So my understanding of evolution is not a ladder, it's a tree which has thousands of branches. Okay? okay. And there is no branch in a hierarchical manner, bigger or smaller, or up or low. It's all the directions where different organisms are sitting. The point no a point to note is that a particular organism sitting on this branch, he's well adapted for that particular thing. Okay. Like an eye, for example, which entirely functions on the light properties. Why would an organism which live in the deep sea in the ocean will ever need an eye? I don't think so. Right. Because it's not needed there. There's something else is needed, chemical cues or like sensations through the water. So right. that organism is well adapted for there. So there comes to your virus. So it's, there's nothing big and nothing small in this living world. Everything has its own importance and virus is one of that kind of thing. It's very simple. It's widespread. You can find it everywhere in the ocean, in the soil, in the air. Yeah. Every day, you name it and virus is there. And interestingly, you will surprise to know the one of the earth shaking paper came in 2001 when the human genome sequence was sequenced. Yes. And from that study, it came out that almost half of human genome has in a retroviral sequence kind of similarities. And this has 550 million years like history where all those vertebrates and that evolution goes back and goes back. And this, these are all the remnants of past infections which got into the germline and integrated with the genome. So it accounts like almost 8% of our genome, which has some sort of similarities or basis in the retroviral kind of elements or retroviral kind of sequences. And then because these are RNAs, they can impact the gene, you know, the expressions, so they can affect, they have a huge impact on us. That's how I see this virus. Yeah. So they have a huge importance like in uh, putting diversity and divergence in terms of evolution. Very interesting character. Interesting indeed. But, uh, you know, I, although I do uh, want to accept that, I have a theory of my own. And I would like for you to confirm it right now because I really believe it's true. Well, first of all, before I go into the theory, sir, do you believe in aliens? Okay. So I answer it this way. If like life can evolve and exist on this planet, there are equal chances that it can evolve and exist on other planets as well. Because life works on simple physical and chemical principles, and those principles exist elsewhere as well. So there is so, an equal possibility that life could arise or exist or evolve on the other part of the universe as well. So for the sake of my argument, I'm going to assume yes. So here's yes, my brilliant theory. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So here's my brilliant theory. This virus, you know why it's causing so much chaos? Because it's an alien. How true is that? That's hard to believe, okay? Uh, because to, in science, it's like uh, testing and verifying, and then finally you say something. It's not like, you know, coffee, coffee table talk. Though coffee table ideas end up like in great ideas at the end. But at the moment, like, I would not, you know, uh, myself put in this position to saying something that it's alien. Uh, uh, of course, it can come, but... For this uh, particular pandemic, I think it had a genetic uh, origin. Might have come from the animals or somewhere else, which are already existing on this planet. And there are like in the past, we had several cases, such, such cases. So until we verify it, test it, I don't want to say that it's an alien. But for my satisfaction, there's this little, little chance. No, little there chance. is no little chance no. until you verify or test it or scientists <laughs> do it. Okay, fine. I'll... I'll, I'll just throw my... It, I thought it was a billion dollar idea. That's why. Anyway, I'll just throw it out the window. And so yeah. coming to us as humans, can we evolve into something else as much more further than human species? Because And how can that take place? That would be yeah, so Prana, like uh, if Neanderthals can exist before us, I think yeah. something can exist after us. Because I'm very egotistical and think we are the best of the best. No, we are not best of the best. Maybe down the line. Okay. <laughs> so I always say that, you know, like, like Homo sapiens are somewhere. They are somewhere. They're, 
there are many more species down there, right? And then like from where we diverged, like in most recent paper, like just a few days ago, they were, they were talking about that these um, Neanderthals and like Homo sapiens, they have a common ancestors. And then yeah. there were yeah. some, some, some genetic material so exchange. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so all that. So, so, so I strongly believe that yes, down the line, but unfortunately, that's not going to happen in our lives, Prana, unfortunately. But down the line, yeah, of course, there can be something, something else, okay? Which they might be discussing that Homo sapiens were there and existed once. If we can talk about the Neanderthals today. Wow, that, that sounds both epic and dangerous at the same time, you know? Like, uh, why, why would you say like dangerous? Like many species have, uh, you know, and uh, just extinct in the past. Dinosaurs are best examples. I think they ruled the maximum of the earth, like almost 300 million years or something like that. And when they went away, nothing happened. You have, we have beautiful prana here. <laughs> I'm beautiful. Thank you. But, but okay. But, but for right now though, in today's society, uh, yes, you talk about the merits of evolution and how it is needed, but how can it help us in today's society as it is? I think evolution. evolution has become, you know, more and more important as years are passing. And because uh, besides it's a key role in understanding basic biological mechanisms and okay. processes, there are two areas which I would particularly like to highlight where like society can benefit from it. The evolutionary understanding will, will make us to understand better the antibiotic resistance and the new viral infections, which are coming every other day. Nowadays, the frequency has increased because the human interventions in the other life systems has increased manifold. And because of that, they are exposed to us, we are exposed to them. So to handle those kind of pandemics, like HIV, influenza, now this COVID-19, I think because you see that it's one simple fact, you know, like many interesting facts that's come from this COVID-19, like gender bias, like males are more prone to this, this virus oh. than, the, than the females, right? Some, some data has already started coming up. So, uh, like country-wise, you see the death rate so where does, you know, how will you explain all these differences? It's the evolution of biology or the evolution of biologists. They are going to tell, yeah, this particular population has that particular kind of genetic, you know, makeup or framework. That's how they were more prone to this. They were less prone to this. The kind of, the immune resistance and like man, many more things which are going to come up. Second thing which I would like to highlight that if you have a better understanding of evolutionary biology as a scientist or as a citizen, I think we have a more control on the conservation and we can particularly pinpoint on the species which are under more threat right now and what kind of conservation mechanisms we should develop. And I think this will also like, it needs to be, you know, like the policymakers and scientists revolutionary biologists should be talking now, I think. Okay. These are well, some, some, some benefits, yeah, society, society can have from the evolution biology. That was actually pretty informative, and th that thing is that said about males being more infected. I, uh, I'm pretty sure most people do not know that, but by, by until right now. So that's an exclusive clip from Ask about. How about that? <laughs> Whatever. I think those are preliminary findings. It needs to be verified and tested again. Yeah. yeah. What are those underlying factors? Yeah. Well, well, sir. I mean, thank you so much. I mean, this I'm fast, sure has been really, really informative, and thank you for doing this for us. And but no, we... I'm enlightened, you know, whenever students <laughs> ask us questions, yeah, I feel so well, happy that people I'm are back. trying to understand evolution and being an evolution biologist, it's my duty to spread the word. All right, all right. Well, well, I'm glad you feel that way. And But before we leave, sir, I want to ask this one important question. Like you mentioned at the top of the interview, your love affair with Rosafella is no secret, right? But, or rather, but has it, how has it grown? across the years, it's something which I want to know and I would like to end the interview with that. So, yeah, with flies, you know, like, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, like, uh, this is an, uh, this is an, uh, you know, an, um, uh, one, 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 one on one relation, like I can watch flies in the tube, like hours and hours and one might find it really frustrating. So, uh, like, it's like when you, when you answer one question, you know, like, uh, 
it opens a window for another 10 questions, okay? And then you pick like, where would you like to go? And then you, then you find something else. And being a scientist, for me, the most satisfying moment is whenever I discover something new, those, those, uh, those few fraction of seconds, I feel it so proud that I found it and I knew it first. Those are the moments and I look for those moments and I always like those who are, those who are coming in the research, they, uh, they should have such, such feelings or like they, they should see the world around them like this way. Then only that, I think that they can see. Yeah. That you a whatever, moment. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, sir, uh, thank you so much for doing this for us. And uh, again, I wish uh, you and your family to be safe. I hope everything will be all right in a few months. And thank you for doing this so much. Sir. I also hope so, that you guys can come out on the streets and enjoy. Definitely. Thanks for having me here once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you.